Now, why, why is Europe different from America in this respect? I asked many Europeans to explain it to me. Um, the conundrum is, in America, you've got 50, 60 percent of the people attend a church. In Europe, it's like 2 percent. Why this huge difference? So I asked, every time I had a chance to, to, to meet an intelligent European, I would ask them. And I finally got some interesting answers, which were not what I expected. Um, I asked this French person once, I said, is, how about, is it the cafe? Is that your social glue? No, not anymore, not really, she, they said. I said, well, what is it? And they said, well, first of all, all European countries are small and they speak different languages. Okay? So if you move to a new job, you don't move 5,000 miles away like you do in America. You move 200 miles away. You can still come and see the parents on the weekend or the, the, the cousins, you know, whatever. So the, the extended family still means a lot more in Europe than it does here. In America, the extended family was broken up long ago, largely by the forces of capital. Uh, it's, it's, it's easy. As someone who grew up in the academic world, I know this very well. You, you, you get a job offer in North Dakota with tenure track, you go. And if you never see your family, your, your parents or your cousins again, that's life. You know, there's always, there's always email. Stay in touch with email, you know. There was an ad that came out for the telephone back in the 80s, a telephone company, uh, reach out and touch someone. I always got a good laugh out of that because that's exactly what you don't do with a telephone. You don't reach out and touch someone. You reach out and distance. You long distance them. So you don't have to touch them. You don't have to share the, breathe the same air in the same room with these sons of bitches, you know. They're far away and you can have some kind of nonsense about uh, telephone communities or internet communities or something and pretend that you've got a social existence. When I say these things in front of audiences, there's always one person who says, well, that's not true. I met my boyfriend through the internet. You know, it's a very social thing. I wouldn't have any friends if it weren't for the internet. And I go, oh God, I feel so sorry for the, you know. <laughs> uh, that, uh, I mean, this is like saying, I wouldn't have a wife if it weren't for, you know, Filipino, uh, uh, you know, those send away for a Filipino bride kind of thing, you know. Well, that, that's not a defense. I'm afraid this is not this is not convincing me of your philosophical soundness when you say something like that. It's making me sad. That's all. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So the the importance of the intentional community now, like the importance of the temporary autonomous zone, which is let's say a temporary communitas. Even that has to me has become even more important than than it, when I first started thinking about these ideas back in the early 80s. Uh, because <clears throat> then you could assume that the TAZ or the community was a third way, that you just opt out of the spectacle, you know, uh, plague on both their houses. Uh, we're going off into the countryside and we're going to have our own life. But now it's not a third way. It's the only other way. So if there's a dialectic, if there's a if there's a dialectic of resistance left in America, it would be, in my mind, only possible through intentional community. And I'm desperate to see more consciousness of this. That's why I continue to write on these subjects. Um, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm not a practical person. I'm not, I'm not a farmer. I'm not an architect. I'm not a builder. I'm, you know, and I'm not a very well-organized person in any case. So it's, I don't feel that I can be the... <clears throat> you know, the, the prophet leading people with them out into the actual, you know, wilderness. But at least I could point this out, that uh, we have a history of intentional community, of communities of resistance in America. It would be good to be inspired by, because we really need that information now. And we really need to think about the possibility of disengaging from the technopathocracy. It's like dropping out, as we used to say in the 60s. It's not that different. You know, I don't like the turn on, tune in part because it makes you sound like a radio. Uh, I don't want to be a machine. But the dropout part, I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. I, I look at the, for example, the Anabaptist communities like the, uh, uh, the uh, Amish. And I see that they're leading a, a, a comfortable life in community because they've refused certain forms of technology. They don't have telephones in the house because they feel that that would get in the way of their physical the physical aspect of their community. And every piece of technology that they've thought about, I studied the history, they thought about not because, you know, God said that telephones were evil, it's because 
with telephones, their community would start to fall apart. They saw that very clearly in 1907 when they decided not to use telephones. Uh, if they had cars, this would mean that they could live apart from each other instead of next to each other. So they decided not to have cars because their prime value was community and the chance to to live what they considered an authentic life. Now, for them, that means you know some kind of Protestant uh, fanaticism I'm not terribly attracted to. But I do admire them because they're the only true Luddites that I see. They're the only people who have realized the connection between the social and technology and done something about it. So that would be, that's the gist of my answer about the importance of, of these communities.